How's it going, everyone? Welcome into yet another debate night. Uh, I'll introduce the guests here in a second, but I'm your host, Hunter. You can't see me because even this program we use hates me so much that even when I use the computer that we've used for every episode of this that Trevor uses every week and it never breaks, here I am, broken. So you're just going to get the me version of me, the real me, if you will, uh, hosting this show. So hopefully, luckily, as the host, it won't be nearly as distracting as when I was a guest analyst. So I'll be out of the way. I'll stay out of the way of the episode. You'll just hear me from behind this picture the whole time. But let's introduce our host. First off, top left, man of the people. I wish you could see the shirt I'm wearing because I'm rocking the man of the people shirt. None other than Brody Smith. Yeah, you know, interesting thing here. Man of the people um, went to the comments as always. Obviously, top comment is... When is Yuli going to be on the show? People want Yuli. I don't know what the situation is with that, with Trevor and scheduling. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, interesting. Can can you be man of the people, but have another person also claiming to be man of the people? That is an interesting thing. You got Dustin in the comments saying man of the people here, <laughs> greeting you all in the comments. Something to think about. Uh, Hunter, I don't know how you feel about that, having two men of the people on the show. I mean, show. you can have men of the people. Um, I think that's a thing. But you know. There's only one on the shirt I'm wearing, and unfortunately you can't see it, so you'll just have to guess. And then probably my favorite comment is, I love that dogs can interrupt and talk over people, but Brody may not. Uh, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> a bunch of that good points being made in the comments there. Next up, we have Jake. How's it going, yeah. Jake? Not too bad. Not too bad. This is... Um, I'm on a my own kind of break 57 conquest and it's just a beat Brody conquest. I've yet to beat Brody on this show. If I beat Dustin, that'd be miraculous, but I'm, you know, one step at a time here. So yeah, just tackle the bottom Brody, rung of the ladder first. Yeah. It's, it's nothing personal. It's just every time we go head to head, we tie. So I just got to beat you by one. Be interesting. All right. We're doing the points this week. Yeah, oh, yeah. I am. We did talk about this before the show. I am a little bit more stingy with the points. You got to earn them a little bit more with me but you know that could be good could be bad dustin's back yet again hoping to take down another victory how are you doing today dustin another vic i haven't gotten one yet so i'm not sure what you mean i've been getting smashed by animated Ooh. green screens and then the blue eyes of gary uh but neither one of them are here today so maybe there is some some solace some hope that maybe i can get something done we'll see that is true. And luckily for you, my computer's so bad, I can't get lost in anyone's eyes, even if Gary was here. So Sweet. that does play well to you. Last but certainly not least, we have Michelle coming in. Is it, is it like, what, 1 a.m. where you're at again? Uh, 12 a.m. Or... Ah, 12 a.m. Close yeah, enough. How are you doing? Night then. <laughs> uh, I'm really good. I'm happy to be back. All right. Let's hop into the show here. Super exciting show ahead of us we've got all kinds of topics we're gonna talk a little bit about a b's slip if you even want to call it that we've got some fan submitted topics um we're going to talk about disc golf drama obviously we got to talk about that some commentary and a whole bunch of stuff but we're going to kick it off with this first one as beaver state fling marked the halfway point into the disc golf pro tour season given what has happened so far and what you think is going to happen the rest of this year who do you think is going to end up being the MPO and FPO player of the year and why we're going to kick it off with Brody. Go ahead. Yeah. First thing I'll say is I kind of like that disc golf has taken the, on the UFC route where after every single event in the UFC, the discussion is like, who is the best? Who's going to be fighting for the title next? That doesn't, we don't really see that in other sports as much. Like you're not really debating after every week in the NBA. Oh, who's the best player in the NBA now? Like it just doesn't change all that often. Same thing in the NFL. Um, you can have some of the top quarterbacks have an off week. And then you don't all of a sudden just say like they're a terrible quarterback. But I like that disc golf, you know, every week we're talking about who's the best player in the world right now. Okay. Well, the, who's the best? Oh, well, who's the best player now? Oh, well, who, but I'll say this FPO. It's obvious. Um, I think it's going to be Kristen Tatar. I think it's even easier this year. Uh, this is a hot take. I think it's even easier this year because so many other FPO players are starting to win that. I think it's going to spread it out more. And then Kristen will just rack up a bunch of other wins. And so um, it's going to be a pretty much clear cut as it was last year. Uh, not as dominant, but still clear cut MPO. I kind of running out of time here, but, Dark Horse Simon Lazat. No one's really talking about him. 
But here, here, hear me out on this. His last event he won in MCO. Uh, last year, the last couple of events that we're coming up to, he took 10th, uh, top 10 at DMC and Ledgestone. He took top five at MVP and USDGC. He won D Glow. I love him at Worlds. I don't think there's been a player that's gone out to Worlds and played it blind and played better than Simon did at New London. I love him there. And if you think about it, Isaac Robinson was not in the conversation at all in the first half of the season as player of the year. So could we see Simon that already has a win in the first half come back on tour late and make a push? I say yes. Speaking of late, Brody made some great points, but most right. of them were too late. So bring him back down to earth a little bit there. Next up, tackling this argument, we got Jake. What do you think, Jake? Yeah, I, I like where both MPO and FPO is at, and I'll get to FPO second because I do actually disagree with Brody on what he was saying. Uh, but for MPO right now, it's starting to look like it's Ganon's to lose. And I think, like last year, it's boiling down to consistency, right? Ganon still has the best average finishing place but talking about who's going to be the player of the year at this point in the year is always a bit of a of a toss-up because we still have the majors left to go and like brody said isaac robinson kind of came out of nowhere in the second half of the season to win that award um you know we looked at um sorry i just lost my train of thought there he but didn't win. oh no he didn't win but he came out of nowhere to become a finalist sorry about that but either way what I'm starting to see, though, is that, you know, Gannon and Calvin are my two top runners right now. And right now it's going to Gannon slightly. But I do think this brings up the bigger conversation of how do we balance out major to elite wins? Um, do we weigh them three to one, two to one? Because as these races get closer and closer, if let's say Gannon wins a major, but Calvin only wins two elite series, do we give that to Gannon? Um, I think the next few months are going to be very interesting in that conversation for FPO, however, I do think right now the door is open for some players to really step up, whether that is a player like Missy Gannon, Holland Hanley, whether Paige Pierce makes a resurgence and makes a comeback. Wouldn't that be a great story to be player of the year? Um, I think the door is open. I agree that Kristen Tatar is the front runner and will be the front runner, but I think the door is open right now for other FPO players to step in. All right. So we've got some differing opinions there. What do you think on it, Michelle? Okay, so I think that MPO Player of the Year uh, is quite easy. It's either going to be Burr or Calvin, uh, but it totally depends on who gets more wins and who uh, can perform in the majors. Uh, both have gotten wins in plural uh, this season, and they're always in the mix. Uh, I'm actually throwing out AB on purpose because I don't think you can live on merits from the start, even if it was a phenomenal start. Um, for me, if you're going to be Player of the Year, you have to perform all year. Um, I also think that FPO is kind of divided, and it's hard to say now that we haven't seen the European ladies in a while. Uh, we've seen, we have like two FPO players who's really found their complete game this season, both Evelina and Holland. Um, I think this year they have gotten the wins in, they are always in the top. Uh, both of them have a solid game, and they throw far. Um, obviously, I can't say that Kristen is out of the, that mix, but uh, she's gotten beaten this year and she's injured right now at some status. I also think that Owen is a candidate because she is fierce and dangerous and she's always in the top. So FPO is going to be super exciting to watch this coming competitions. And now that Holland has finally won, there might not be anything to stop her. There you have it. Uh, some more differing opinions on there. I also completely forgot to start the timer, so I don't know if she went over or not. Can't take points away there. Post <laughs> error. We got to roll with it. Dustin, wrap it up. What do you think? We've heard a slew of different opinions. Bring it home for us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough because we only have had one major so far out of the four, and the guy who won the major for MPO was not even really in the conversation for player of the year at this point because he hasn't really followed up. So that makes it kind of open, depending on how the last three majors play out for MPO. But if you're going to pick someone MPO, you got to pick Ganon Bird. The dude's won three events, which is tied for the top amount of wins for any MPO player right now so far this season, two of which were Elite Plus events, which are harder events to links or more rounds. He's also only finished outside of the top 10 a single time, so the consistency is huge. 
And he's also won multiple different ways. He's been able to go wire to wire and dominate like he did at Portland. And then here at the Beaver State Fling, he actually had some adversity. He had to kind of fight his way back into it. He was down by a few strokes. So, you know, it took him a little bit to get back into it. So, you know, he's been able to win multiple ways. And he passes the eye test. He's just got a complete game. You know, like everything seems to be pretty much going his way. Calvin Heinberg is a candidate, sure, because he's only one win behind, and he's also been pretty consistent. So the majors could maybe be an equalizing factor, but AB's fallen off too much, in my opinion, to stay in the conversation for now. Uh, as far as FPO goes, it's got to be Tatar still. Three wins, tied with Evelina Solomon for most wins on the season. Yes, she is injured, but supposedly she's supposed to be back for the, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Krokow Open in Norway in July. So that'll give her a chance to still play plenty of more events before the year is over, as well as still play multiple majors. Um, she never finished outside the top five in the six events she's already played. So, yeah, I think she's definitely still the front runner, though. Evelina is in the mix, and she can maybe pop off a couple of big wins since she did win a major. Slight rebuttal. All right, we got a slight rebuttal from Brody. I do find it interesting that we have, we kind of split here. We've got two people locked in on Kristen. Two people think it's more up in the air. I do like Brody's point of maybe the mix of FPO talent actually leaning towards Kristen's favor because it might spread things out. But Dustin right. also brought up a good point where Evelina is kind of right there right now, but Brody slight rebuttal hit it. Yeah. My slight rebuttal is on the, I mean, obviously on the MPO side, I, I think everyone was going to say uh, Gannon and Calvin. That's why I went a different route. Cause that was the obvious answer. Um, I will say the AB thing, Jake, you kind of said, or Michelle, I think you said, uh, talking about a B like the, the beginning of the season. I think that's kind of like the college football of where you can lose your first game and still make it into the playoffs in college football. But if you lose your last game, those people normally never get to go, even though those games should be weighed the same. I think it's the same in disc golf. Like the wins at the beginning of the season, easy season should be weighed just as much as the wins at the end, but they don't obviously. Um, but the one rebuttal I have with Dustin is you, basically, you did just kind of describe like the way that Gannon has won. Like that's kind of how everyone's done it with AB and Calvin and everyone. Like they've all gone out and been the front runner and won, and they've all been able to win. Not we've seen guys win, not even on league card too. I don't think that's a big thing for Gannon. I think with Gannon, what we're seeing right now is he is just starting to, uh, just be a much more complete player from T to green. Um, and we're starting to see a consistency that we haven't, you know, he's just basically making it to where his floor is raising. I don't think his ceiling is getting that much higher. I don't think he's playing a level that we've uh. never seen before, uh, but his floor, his floor, which is, I think the problem with some of these other guys, his floor is getting much and much higher. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I do think his forehand distance is a little bit up this year. I don't know if you would agree or disagree with that. It, it, not like by a crazy so. amount, but like it does seem a little higher. I've even seen some people kind of comment on it, but you're right. I do think it's more the floor raising than the ceiling raising for him. And it's just a consistency factor, uh, yeah. which is kind of what you're already talking about. Like people are slipping in certain tournaments where he's just not like he's just always there. So, yeah. I do find it interesting the point you made about relating to college football because last year I think that was what led to there even being an argument player of the year wise because obviously my argument with it was the majors but the big factor was Calvin's wins stopped in April yeah and so by the time October November rolled around they were almost a distant memory like you almost had to be reminded of how good he was at the beginning of the season. Uh, and that could definitely be the case for AB come the end of the year. If no one won, sure. He would be tied for the most wins, but I and, think he'd be out of the conversation and quick rebuttal real quick, just real fast. You have to, you have to remember too. like, we have to think about how hard it is to win. So like Calvin winning early in the season last year, you can't just like discredit that because right now Gannon could have two less wins and Luke Humphreys could have two wins. If one throw changed in each tournament. That's that's literally how close it is in those two wins from Gannon. Is literally Luke changes his throw one time at the end of the stretch, and now Luke Humphreys potentially has two wins, and Gannon has two less wins. So something not to forget. There you have it. Now, one guy that we've been talking about quite a bit is none other than Anthony Barella. So let's focus in on him really quick because it started off as – you know, maybe, oh, he's outside the top 10. Oh, he slipped a little bit more. And then the last two events have come kind of shocking. So he started his year with seven top 10s, including three wins, but has since went 14th, 18th, 44th, 61st, 
What do you think is the cause of this slip, if there is one, and is it going to continue? We'll kick it off with Jake. I mean, to answer that first part, yeah, there's definitely a slip here, but are we surprised at the slip? You know, if you look back historically at Anthony Brella's performance throughout the season, this is kind of how it goes. You know, he has some really great performances. You know, his ceiling is a consistent winner, but his floor is into the 70s and 80s. I think I've seen as far back as 2022. You know, he's still a young player, and I think his mental game is a big part of what determines his success. Because when he's confident and locked in, I don't think anyone can stop him. And I think that's what he showed at the beginning of the year. But when he loses that confidence, when he slips up and that morale takes a dip, I mean, if we look at last year, I just pulled up his page here. There's, you know, a stretch where he'll go fifth, 11th, third, and then 39th. And then another stretch where he'll go ninth, first, and then second, and then 70th, right? So this is what we see from him pretty consistently are these big swings up and down. And this is why consistency matters in the player of the year conversation, as we just talked about, is, you know, Anthony Barella can win, Gannon Burr can win, but Gannon Burr has not finished, you know, 44 throughout the season. So I think this slip up is part of who Anthony Barella is as a player right now. I think he's got to work on consistency and has to work on that mental game. Once he gets those things locked down, I mean, he's right up there with the best of them and he might be close to impossible to beat if he ever figures that out. Okay, so Jake's not buying that the AB we saw at the beginning of the year was a changed AB like many people had thought. What are your thoughts on it, Michelle? Well, last time I was on the show and talked about AB, I said that his streak wouldn't continue because the field is way too strong. Uh, I mean, everyone talked about how hard it was to do what Calvin did last year, and to believe that AB could do the same with his start, that was a long shot. Um, I think that with all the MPO players, only one managed to play good enough to be in the mix like every week last year. Um, players only get better. They push themselves further. So for me, it's not a surprise that AB hasn't continued to be in the top. And I also don't think that 14th or 18th place is that bad with the field being as big as it is. Um, because really, I think the field is way too good and all the jitters from the first tournaments are over. Players have found their game this season. It's the honestly the player who gets all the puzzle pieces together that that weekend that wins and we've also seen a few like um can i call them like one hit wonders uh like ansel out Presnell. i mean not to take away from their wins because and their game because they're great players and ansel played really good this weekend but uh they take in their first big win and haven't got any more yet so i don't think it has anything to do with ab's capabilities but more so to the field itself and how great everyone is um except maybe this 61st place that's a bit odd but it seems that it was his fairway hits and c2 putting that was off other than that i think it was just like one bad blemish to a good year all right so you're more buying into the slip didn't start to like the 44th 61st the first two still solid finishes definitely a way to look at it for sure next up we have dustin Go ahead. Yeah, I, I tend to agree that the 14th and 18th are still pretty solid finishes considering how strong the field is and how hard it is to win. I do think the fact that he got three quick wins was pretty spectacular. You know, it's going to be very hard to anticipate him continuing that type of consistency throughout the entire year, just winning all the time when you have such strong players in the field. So I think there is some merit to that. I think the issue is, is when you're trying to figure out what's going wrong for AB, he hasn't been on coverage much lately, so you can't even really get an eye test on what's going wrong. And so you sort of have to rely on his own words, stats, and then speculation. Unfortunately, he hasn't said anything. He hasn't made any posts on socials in quite some time. He hasn't been a part of a press conference. He hasn't been on a podcast. So we haven't been able to get any insights from him on what he thinks is going wrong, right? Now, as far as stats go, yeah, it is true that the dude was unstoppable on the putting green when he was winning. Like, I think he missed two total circle 1X putts when he won Texas States uh, and only missed six across 35 at Jonesboro. So he was 85% or better from C1X whenever he was winning. And he was also very soft from circle two. When you look at the most recent events, he's been kind of born the 70% range for C1X putting. Uh, and at Beaver State, he was only one for 10 from C2 in round one. But otherwise, his putting was pretty solid. Throwing wise, yeah, his fairway percentages are down the last couple of events compared to when he was winning Texas in Jonesboro. I think the big thing for him, though, is the C2 and regulation stat has really plummeted. He was like in the 70% range C2 regulation when he was winning at Portland Open. He was like 50% in a couple of rounds. And this last tournament, he was also like in the mid 50s or, or even lower than that in some cases. So that has been an issue. And yeah, mental game is always going to be a part of it. Like, yeah, he finally got the taste of winning, 
but it's like now he started to have some failures and it's like can you dig yourself back out of it i think that's another test for him all right so a little mix of everything some putting here some throwing there sounds like that might just be a b brody you've been the closest actually getting to watch him play here and there maybe uh just throwing that out there i could be completely off but <laughs> Wrap yeah, it up definitely for us. Not, definitely not on his card. I don't know what that was. That, that might have been a shot, but it's fine. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, you know, we I haven't I haven't spoken with him since since you know he started kind of this. Uh, I guess if you want to say trend downwards, if you will. Uh, I agree with everyone else. I think 14th and 18th place. Those are throw those out. Let's not talk about those. Uh, but the 44 and the 61. Those are definitely talking points. Um, and to kind of like piggyback off of what Dustin was saying too, the first one being like the final round of the Portland open, uh, he wasn't playing terrible there. He was okay. But the final round, he starts six over through the first five, four, bo four bogeys and then a double. I, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't know if he didn't get his coffee in the morning. Like that, that is, that's something there. Cause a player of his ca uh, cal uh, caliber, he should be starting a course. Um, you know, six over through five. The other thing too, um, he, uh, he finished eight over par by the way, which was 13 shots worse than the previous day on the same course. Uh, the other thing to look at too, he had nine OB shots. So something that we, we heard him talk about a lot was him like starting to power down and have a lot more control. That clearly was, uh, was a problem that round. And then looking at the final round at Beaver state fling, uh, he was seven under through 14. So kind of back to old AB that we know, and then he finished bogey, bogey, double, which kind of blew that uh, roundup. And I would say, too, I would even look at circle two. Dustin, I would look at circle one. At Beaver yeah. State Fling, he had six birdie putts inside a circle, four birdie pet putts inside a circle in round two, and six birdie putts inside a circle round three. That's brutal. That's tough. When you're only having a birdie putt like every three holes, that's going to be tough to get it done out there. Yep. So... After all of this and hearing different stats, I think I'm I think I'm leaning towards Jake's side, where maybe this is just a B, maybe it is just you know Mister Inconsistent, and he just came out the gates firing, and at the end of the day, he is still the same player in there. I well, don't this know. Is, maybe maybe yeah, that is the, the truth of it, because it doesn't really seem like there's oh well his putt just disappeared and that's causing X Y and Z to go wrong. It seems like you know when stuff slips, it can just really slip for him. Yeah, I think if you're going from first to 15th or 18th and it stopped there, then yeah, that's just a swing of like being at the top of the top of the charts. Like you're still top 20, but you're not swinging just to 15th or 18th. He's swinging down to the. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think the big issue is it's like we can look at the stats decline so we can see that like he's not reaching circus regulation as high as he was when he was winning. You know, he's not putting necessarily as well as when he was winning. Those are kind of obvious things that are going to happen, though, if you're not winning. The real thing is, why is that happening? Is it because oh. something's off mechanically? Right. Is it a mental game issue? Is it, uh, you know, just not feeling it that weekend, having an off day? Like, it's hard to know, right? Rebuttal. Those are all, all right. mental. I, this, I, just remember yeah, sure. what I just remembered what happened. So the beginning of the round, the final round at Portland Open, his caddy, was standing underneath the uh, the tent on hole one, but his bag was not underneath the tent. And if you guys remember final round, it was kind of rainy, and those tents can create those puddles. Ooh. And I believe the puddle like over and just completely droused his bag. And so I think mentally maybe, like I think it just completely probably threw him off. So that that's, I forgot that's what happened. That makes a little bit more sense of why he started the way he did. If you want to use that as an excuse. And the only thing I could say too is maybe AB a is not the player like Calvin and Gannon is where you can just pick them up, drop them on a course, and you know they have a chance to win. Beaver State Fling, if you watch, there are a lot of turnover tight flex shots. That is not something that we see a lot of AB. AB loves to get that steep hyzer, loves to throw maybe Luna's flat, but we don't really ever see him like torquing over flex shots like that we see Calvin do, Gannon, or Ezra, Shocker, all three of those on the final card. So that, that would be the only pause I would have is like Beaver State Fling. It is a little bit more of a, a specific shot shaping course. And maybe that's a shot that AB is going to have to work on. That's fair. Yep. All right. Well, we'll see. I'm, I'm hoping Trevor listens to this episode because whenever I've brought up, 
you know, hey, I don't know, AB didn't do so hot here last year. Maybe it's just his game doesn't work with the course on the preview show. Trevor jumps down my throat. So this has been good for me. I've been able to air out my grievances just through y'all instead of me. So all the fingers from Trevor pointed at y'all instead of me. But he's not going to listen to the show. So that's not going to help me. Uh, this next topic was actually fan submitted. You can find a link in the description down below or at the end of the show, we'll throw up a QR code if you want to submit your own and maybe get uh, your topic on the show. But this one was fan submitted. I just slightly reworded it. Um, it. This said, should the DGN stick to a consistent commentary team or do you like the idea of having different commentators for most events and why? We'll kick it off with Michelle. Yeah, I know that someone else is going to have a lot of opinions on this, <laughs> but okay, from a viewer's point, uh, I think the regular like play-by-play -play commentators are doing a great job, and the color commentators have gotten a lot better uh, the last uh, one and a half, two years ago. Like some I couldn't stand to listen to a while back, uh, but with that being said, I think that if you only have like a consistent commentary team, uh, they have to be really good, and the chemistry must be like non-replaceable. Like, if you look at Jomez, they have a great teams that comment every week, and their chemistry is fantastic. Uh, they have a nickname, a fan base. They have a cool intro that's reappearing. They sell shirts, discs with a logo on it, like everything. And I'm not, like, saying that you need all of that, considering that Jomez commentators are players with their own fan base, but you just have two people comment, or three, like, comment MPO and maybe two different people for FPO. They have to be something special and not replaceable. And I think that the quality in the commentators now is not so drastic that it makes you mute the stream anymore, <laughs> like I used to. Um, so all of them are somewhere on the scale from like good to great. Um, and I rather enjoy the change. Like now I've gotten good enough that for someone who watches FPO live every week, it's, I'm pleased with all of them. And I think it's fun to hear like the different old pros talk about the course and the thought process behind different shots. So. I guess I don't see the point of narrowing it down. Okay. So in a roundabout way, you're saying we just haven't found that special duo yet. No, not really. Okay. All right. That's fair. Next up, we've got Dustin, who uh, might have some opinions on this. Let's hear it. Yeah, I obviously worked as a commentator in disc golf and esports, both play-by-play -play and color, depending on the topic. Um, so the thing is, is I think that coming from that background, yes, chemistry does develop between a consistent commentary duo, which in turn can make a better quality product over time because you build a routine, you get comfortable with each other. And then once you have a foundation, you can kind of start tweaking and adjusting things and trying new things out and experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't. And then hopefully you can build a rapport with each other, be able to give each other feedback constructively without taking it personally, you know, also getting feedback from peers and from production and really just kind of mix all that together to eventually polish the product. When you switch in and out new partners, you can disrupt that flow and so you kind of have like a little bit of a reset moment where you have to kind of feel each other out learn with each other likes and wants strengths weaknesses and so on and so that can be an issue now it's not impossible to overcome as long as you're having conversations pre and post broadcast talking through some of those trouble areas getting the feedback and implementing it but it just takes time and it, like i said it can kind of reset things um also if you're trying to implement a person that's like a third commentator and do it that way that just can make balance issues happen where like two people kind of dominate and the third person just kind of phasing in and out and it can become really tough to balance three people versus two if you're trying to go that route but you can also use them for supplemental content you can use them as experts on the course so there's different ways to implement these people that could make it work also hate to say it but not every single pro player is going to be a good commentator or analyst. Like some people are not well-spoken. Some people just are not going to hit. We've gotten incredibly lucky. I think that some of these guys we have been using like calling and Sexton and Earhart are actually very good. And here's the other thing really quick is that it's the ability to be able to commit to it full time. If you're a player and you're touring, you can't commit to the craft of commentary full time, which means you're not gonna be able to hit your peak as people who are committing to it full time. And if you spread the work too thin, it makes it too hard to work on your craft. So you are team zero in, it seems. No, I think it, it, there's room for a variety, but you have to be very careful with how you do it. And the, I think the other big thing real quick just to add is that you don't have a way to work your way up the totem pole and disc off. Like in every other traditional sport, you can kind of work your way up to like the top level broadcast. In disc golf, we only have one live broadcast and it's a top 10 tournaments. So like you don't really have a way to like work your way up, if you know what I mean, gain experience and like go through the bumps and hurdles of a smaller audience and then get to the big audience. Like you are immediately plugged into the biggest audience ever. That's a that's a good way to look at it there. All right, next up, we've got Brody. What's your take on it? Well, there is, there is definitely a little bit of a ladder of, uh, you know, commentary still when it comes to disc golf. You know, we're not throwing 
a new person at, at USDGC to do commentary, right? We're throwing a new team probably at a silver event and then an elite event and then an elite well, plus don't and then majors. Anymore. So there definitely is, we did in the past, but there definitely yeah. is a ladder of going up of like, hey, this event, there's not that many people going to, let's 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 have them on that. Um, it did take Dustin a while, like about, about a minute and 20 seconds to actually get to the point, which is there are some people that are just bad. There are some comment like this wouldn't be a question if all the commentators that we had in disc golf were good. People wouldn't be saying, Hey, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have this person or mix this person up. Like there are some bad commentators and there are some good commentators right now in disc golf. And that's just the way it is. Now, the question I think is more, why aren't we having the good commentators at every event? And if that's a scheduling thing, if that's a, they don't want to do it thing, then we're out of luck. But if that's a disc golf pro tour, disc golf network saying, no, we, we want to have more than just four or five people commentating. We want to have a team of 10. Then I would say that's probably the wrong route to go about it. Um, we have one event oh, every week, every other week, we don't need to have 10 or 15 commentators and left unless it's literally a scheduling issue. Well, do you want me to go ahead and tell you the answer to that question? Because I can tell you the way it is, is that they have so many commentators on staff right now that they're trying to do a rotation where kind of everyone gets to do an almost equal amount of work. They do try to prioritize some more experienced and more popular people, I feel like, for the majors and things that nature, from what I can tell from looking at the broadcast schedule. But you are getting to a point where I just feel like they do have too many people and they're trying to kind of appease everyone and give everybody work, but it's spreading the workload thin. And then, like you said, it's causing maybe like your best commentators not being at every event because they're going to be off for some events. Because I know, for example, someone like, I, I hope this is not going to be like putting out private information, but I think Terry would like to do more stuff than he's doing, but he, he just wasn't asked to do certain things. Um, so it, it, it's kind of is really up in the air, it feels like. Yeah, that's, just, that's just bad I, business to not couple, have the best if you're possible, if, you, if it's a possibility. At, at a couple of these events too, it's a, wait, Jake, have you gone yet? Jake has not gone yet, but oh, yeah. he's gaining some insight. So this might, this might be an all time uh, point I'll gainer hold, here. Yeah. I'll hold off. Let's well, let Jake go. And then we'll, we'll reconvene yeah, my apologies, and, and see, we'll see what happens yeah. here. All right, Jake, you got some new insight that no one else had. Let's see what you do with it here. That is an interesting point. Yeah. I did not know that. And I don't really like that because I was on team. We need consistent commentators um, for a couple of reasons. We talked about this in past shows that, you know, PDJ memberships are down. People are maybe starting to lose interest and that bubble might be close to, you know, bursting. It might just be that disc golf is going to start to swing the other way now. So we want to create as much entertainment value out of our, out of our live broadcasting as possible. And that's not going to come from just trying out new people and seeing what, seeing what sticks. We want the best of the best at the majors, at the events that are the most, in, uh, most viewed have the highest viewership. And then, yeah, we can experiment at some of the, the lower tournaments, the ones that have less viewership, the ones that, you know, maybe are some of the lower series and using some of the other outlets as well, like Gatekeeper and some of the other organizations that cover other tournaments that maybe have some good pros and have some viewership, but aren't on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. I think having top level pros move over to commentary is a good idea, but there are courses out there that they can take for storytelling, for commentating. And that's something that I think we should utilize in disc golf. I think all the other pro sports use it. These guys don't just jump right to the commentary booth most of the time, at least the ones that do and don't take those courses, they don't find success. So I think we should try to replicate that. Make sure that the people that are jumping into the booth are ready for what they're jumping into and keeping them at a lower level until they're ready to be expert storytellers and boost that entertainment value. All right, now, it does seem that pretty much everyone had a consistent take of one of the things that does drive commentary is the chemistry. And Dustin brought up a good point, but everyone kind of hinted around it where like, if you have people rotating in and out, and if it is a scheduling thing of, oh, well, you know, Philo hasn't been on in three weeks, you better throw him back in. Oh, Ian's, it's been two weeks since Ian. Then it might well, I can be- tell you the schedule set at the beginning of the year. So the, the entire year schedule okay. was already made at the end of last year. Now, granted, people just, can drop in and out if something pops up yeah. in their life, but like the schedule set for the year at the beginning of the year. As a commentary, as a commentator, Dustin, is it is it something where if you're not doing it full time and you are just being thrown in once a month or once every like three or four events, is it something where like you can fall in and out of rhythm to where you're just never going to be as as good as you could be as if you were like on it consistently? 
a hundred percent like you can definitely get rusty you can definitely kind of follow the rhythm i think another big thing is if you can't commit to it full time because you're not getting enough work to make enough income to justify it being your full-time job then you can't treat it like a full-time job so you can't do the things that would make you better uh, as easily like doing your research you know going through film studying it kind of figuring out things maybe you want to change or or fix or, or or you know little hiccups that you might want to tweak like you can't do those things because you're probably working some other job to supplement your income um or you just feel like you're not being invested in because you're not being made a full-time broadcaster and, and so there's a lot of mental stuff that can go with it too man honestly so it, it, it's a huge can of worms this topic honestly i would just say too the thing that I th the, the the pairing that I think is the most important is the person in the booth and the person on the ground. The more seamless that is, the more I can never I, I never really get like removed from the moment. And the way that this like you know again like this past week I know there was probably some troubles with connections and whatnot with uh with Nate on the ground, but there was multiple times where you know, there would be a big moment or a big shot coming up. And then like the, the, the transfer from the booth to the person on the ground was so shaky, so rocky, not smooth at all. That kind of just threw me off and I kind of got removed from the moment. I think that right there is pro cause I've said this in the past. I think the person on the ground should almost be commentating every shot, almost every shot because they can actually see way more than the people in the booth can. So like, there's so many times where it is Dustin. Like if I'm on the T pad, I can see more than what you can see. Depends on camera angles and stuff like that. But mm. in, theory, if someone's you're in right. the woods, if someone's in the woods, how many times have we seen a camera just literally show a tree and then someone like, for example, like Gannon, Gannon, um, what was it? It was Gannon's putt or something. And I think Philo and Ian, it was on hole four. Philo and Ian were like, He's got no shot. Like this is gonna be impossible. Like, oh my gosh, he might, he might throw, he might put this OB. It's gonna be so hard to get through. And then like he clanks it off the cage. Like he had a, he had a straight wide open putt through the trees. That's what I'm saying is like, for a lot of the trees scrambling, yeah, having, sure. someone, agree on having that. someone on the ground there is so vital. And I just feel like that's a big L in a lot of cases. Um, so I don't know. I think that's. I, that's when you cut to the ground, people. Otherwise, you know, I think the commentators need to know the course is like the back of their hand. So when they're seeing a shot and it kicks right, they can say hey, they're in jail. Then the scrambling, that's when you jump to the guy on the, be, be on the And a lot of that also comes down to whether the commentators are on site or remote. And it we, also comes down to whether or not they've gotten to walk through the course or not, which is but, massive. But guys, we've all played disc golf. Like if you're a foot off the fairway, in some instances, you have no shot. In other instances, oh, wow, there's a gap. I got super lucky. Like you won't right. know that unless you're standing behind the disc. That's, sure. That's that's all I'm, I'm agreeing with that. Yeah, I'm agree. agreeing with that. When they scramble, go to the field. But like you just said, the the commentator should know the course. They should have walked it. They should have played it theoretically. But even, but We're even off, but off of sport. Yeah, but even off the tee though, Jake. Even off the tee, the person on the ground is going to have a better uh, vantage point and know, uh, like, oh, that's gonna be the farthest drive. Versus the commentators, they have to wait for the catch cam to switch, then wait to see it. Pat like it's clear if me and Hunter were standing on a tee and Hunter threw and then I threw, it's clear within a second whose disc is going to go farther. If you're there on the ground, filming that's not the case. Now I don't know how it works in other sports, so someone who does, feel free to jump in. But to me, I feel like it should almost be a like producer's role of like making sure the person on the ground, like when they have context or if they're going to need context to like get them in position and then tell the commentator it's ready. I feel like Terry does a pretty good job of, he doesn't throw it to people. A lot. They catch yeah, I'll say Terry a lot. throws it to people when like, he seems to know where they're at and know what they can see. Ian sometimes, and this is one of my big qualms with Ian is I feel like he relies on the person on the ground and they don't know it. He's like, Nate, Nate, what, what's, what are you looking at? Nate? What, what is he in bounds? Is he in bounds? And then that's... Nate's like, I don't know. I'm actually six holes away, Ian. Let me sprint. And he's like, yeah, oh. that's, that's tough because you can't know if it's like a tech issue that's causing that problem or if that is yeah. just like a, hey, he, he's gambling that someone's in the right spot and, and that's he's doing the wrong point, thing. Though, yeah. It's like a lot of times too, like the way you throw it to the ground, it shouldn't be like, oh my gosh, Hunter, is that out of bounds? Is that in bounds, Hunter? <laughs> it, it should be more of like, Hunter's like, you don't need Ian to ask Hunter whether or not it's inbounds or out of bounds. 
it sh- Ian should just not say anything. And Hunter should have the floor. You see what I'm saying? It's way cleaner if 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 Ian isn't saying anything and Hunter goes, oh my gosh, that did that did just roll out of bounds. Yeah. Versus Ian going, Hunter, did that go out of bounds? Next shot. Oh, There's Hunter, also- how, how far do you think he is from there? Next shot. Hunter, is he going to have a look from there? Next shot. Hunter, what do you think that like do you see what I'm saying? Like that pattern. Yeah, but what I would but what I would so also bad. say is that the back and forth is a lot tougher when the person's not sitting right next to you versus like uh-huh. doing it remotely with each other. Like it's very hard to pass back and forth and understand who should come in, when and where when you're not sitting next to each other and you can see like you're the cues Ian and stuff like and that. Philo aren't sitting next to each other. Oh, they are hundred percent. I'm talking about the person on the course. Like if you're a so commentator in the booth. Like you sh- they should have a better understanding that the person on the course in certain in certain times. During the broadcast, the person on the course should be the one to talk. As long as you coordinate that, like through a production meeting beforehand, I, yeah, I mean, that, I could see that. Being fine. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say is I think it would be much better instead of having the person in the booth every single time. Is that in bounds? How far is he? Like mm-hmm. asking these questions every single time, it, it makes the it makes the live just really really jump junky in my opinion. It, yeah, that's no, that's how I. Feel. I think that's course yeah, dependent. I, I, I don't think it happens already? every time. You yeah. that's, just, that's just a whole. That's just a whole different style of commentary then, because almost every other sport is commentated from the booth, not from the field. So I don't know. It's just different. Not I'm golf. not saying. I'm not, not saying yours is wrong. Not yeah, the I'm sport not saying that we're wrong. literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get what you're saying. We're literally bad. Like the no, person understand. that's talking about the putt is the person that's on the green looking at the putt. I could tell you another thing that it could be, and, and, and you'll laugh at this one, but it could just literally be that the audio quality is probably likely worse than the person on the course and the people in the booth with better equipment and you want the better sound quality. Well, like, that literally the, could be I know that the connection is a thing. But Michelle, yeah, exactly, I'm, so that could be I'm it. I'm curious about what my, my Michelle says that she likes it that way, the, the asking the no, question. No, but I think it's, I think it's fun in, in certain aspects, the conversation between the booth and, and the ground. Oh, yes. And like it, it builds, um, it builds like, oh my God, is that, is that OB? And then get confirmation. It can, oh. it can, it can build or debuild just getting like, no, oh, it's inbounds. Like it doesn't create anything. It's just a statement. Oh. I can see the suspense argument. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of my favorite shots was, uh, that's nice they, about like, commentary. We never all can agree. They were yeah. looking at, yeah, that's, I think that's what the toughest thing when you're in the disc golf network shoes is like, you got people who love Ian and Philo and then you got people like me who are like, if Ian and Philo never showed up again, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, but one of my favorite shots from the tournament this past right weekend was a disc was in the woods and Perkins was trying to get a shot at it, but he was trying to get out of the way before another shot came in and he didn't know a camera was on it. And you just saw Nate Perkins hunched over just sprinting out of the woods. Cause Ian was asking <laughs> him about the shot and he was trying to get out of earshot. And he like tuned in, just panting, like, yeah, yeah, Ian, I just gotta look at it. <laughs> and it was like, oh, it's hysterical to have the full context of like that's probably what this poor man's going through. It's a good thing he was a wide receiver previously because they just got him sprinting. sprinting. He's just running routes for Ian. Ian just like throwing it to him mid thing. Like they're just running audibles every play, and the poor guy's just sweating running around out there. I don't know. I, don't I will, know. Just Hunter. I will say though, figure out. I will say Philo at Beaver State Fling. I do like Philo at Beaver State Fling. I so he can tell that. you about his philo betros or whatever every time they get okay. to that hole. We don't need we don't need that three or four times every day. Um, like, did you? Oh, did you know this was the hole that that historic shot <laughs> happened on? Well, if not, I'm gonna tell you seven more times before they leave the hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and clip it in two more times. It's actually sad yeah. I've gotten sick of seeing that clip. You know, it is such an amazing shot. It's just like, all right, I have seen it like a million times now. <laughs> Ah, I mean, let's just let's just let it breathe for a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. you maybe just now, save that for the final day and leave it at that. Yeah. Now imagine if there was a guy on the green with a, a lightsaber in that shot. Oh, we'd be having a different conversation. Fascinating. Fascinating. True. Maybe we just give Perkins a lightsaber. Maybe that <laughs> solves everything. Like a laser pointer. We can just see him running through the woods. Yeah. Hundred percent. All right. Final question here as we head into the finals. Well, question before the finals. I guess you put it that way. Uh, sure. As disc golf has gotten more media coverage, we've seen an increase in players getting upset about the quote unquote drama that comes with the media coverage is said drama good or bad for the sport of disc golf and why Dustin. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where like drama just comes with the territory. Like at the end of the day, this is an entertainment product and you are in the public eye. And so drama is going to be a part of things. Now, I don't mean you should be subjected to abuse, so that goes too far, but I'm just saying like, you kind of know that that's what you're getting into. Um, now there is difference between drama on the course versus off the course. And there's also difference between drama and then like just straight up gossip. 
And there's also varying degrees of like how toxic certain drama can be and how it can more be like friendly in a, a sort of way, but still be helpful. So obviously drama on the course is great because it helps build storylines. It adds to the coverage and it's fair game because you know the cameras and coverage teams are out there so you can control how you conduct yourself and, and what you say and what you do. So I think that's all fair game. Now off the course, you know how that's going to be a part of the scene. It's going to be a part of media. It's going to be a part of podcasting. And it's going to bring attention to the sports. It's going to provide content to consume. It's going to provide engagement. It's going to provide clicks. And these all can be considered positives, by the way. But it can also get nasty when people's reputations get hurt or things turn to hearsay or defamation. And things can get out of control. And I know that some people say that all press is good press. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, look at what's happened to someone like Nico LaCastro. Like the drama that he's had with either the slow play or the official thing at the European Open obviously hurt his reputation personally, but it also shed a bad light on the sport for people outside of it watching someone conduct themselves that way in disc golf. So I think it depends on the drama. Like I'm down for like banter and player rivalries and trash talk amongst players and things of that nature. But when things get like toxic and nasty it can be more of a negative than a positive so it just depends on how you take it all right brody what are your thoughts on this yeah i have no idea what dustin just said at the end of like nico playing slow is like a pro like have you do you watch other sports do you yeah. see what like do you see what people talk about in other sports like that's to like that is toxic. People like just saying that Nico's a slow player. I, I don't. I, that was, I, that's what I was saying. Was I, toxic. I, I was I, talking about the player official thing being toxic. Sorry. Still, even then, it's like other sports. They literally hockey. They literally fight each other. They literally punch each other. I mean, I. Okay. Um, I'll leave it as this: the definition of drama, an exciting, emotional, or unexpected series of events or set of circumstances. The antonyms of drama. For those that don't know, that's that's the opposite of drama. Monotonous, uneventful, uninterested, apathetic, indifferent, boring. <laughs> which which sport would you tune into? And I'll leave it at that. That's fair. All right. Wow. That was my that might have been Brody's shortest turn ever. Yeah, maybe his most impactful. Something it was impactful. I liked it. Uh Jake, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm agreeing a lot with what Dustin has said so far, right? And much like the courses are getting tougher and the courses need to get physically more challenging in order for players to grow and exceed expectations, there's got to be some drama, right? We have to have the conversations of, hey, is AB going to come out of this swing? Is he always going to be Mr. Inconsistent? He's got to hear that and he's got to say, all right, this is where I want to step up. You know, same thing with Kristen. You know, she's coming back. There's some drama there. Will she come back from an injury better? Same thing with Paige. These are conversations that need to happen for the players to really lock in and say, hey, I need to be better or I need to live up to exceed these expectations because this is what the fans want. This is what they expect. This is what sponsorships are looking at. Those are healthy conversations. I think Dustin touched on a good point, though, where drama in the sense of personal attacks, drama in the sense of anything that's not related to the game is pretty unhealthy for the sport. And that kind of toxic environment turns people away. Right. He's the Nico uh, example. But, you know, there's plenty of stuff going on on Twitter, plenty of those conversations, and it's drawing more attention to our sport for sure. But I would just stress that I think that professionals on the PDGA tour, when they are looking at this drama, when they're hearing their fans talk about things, they need to direct conversations as well towards things that they want to hear. Right. They want to make sure that they're staying as constructive debates and constructive conversations rather than trying to tear each other apart. Um, I think that's an important part of being a, a professional in the public's eye, in the entertainment realm like we are. All right. We next, last but not least, have Michelle to round it out. Yeah, I think that like some of the drama is good for the sport. I think that the thing with media nowadays is that you can't, like today in this golf, you can't cheat. You can't use misuse, misuse rules. Uh, you can't be a bad sport because it, it all comes to the surface. Um, it does bring up rules. It gets people talking about what is right and what is wrong. Um, if some people misuse rules or do the wrong thing, I think it's really good that it gets people talking and it makes everyone play by the same rules. I also think that it pushes sportsmanship forward. Uh, so you have to be professional, a good player, because if you're not, it will be shown on coverage all over um, and people will talk about it. Uh, I don't know exactly what kind of players who's getting upset, um, but I personally don't think that anyone has gotten talked about that much and 
completely without grounds. Um, I do think that what is bad is this coverage isn't that big and isn't covering everyone. It gives certain players more time on media than others. And situations like the jump putting with Kristen and Valerie Manahano is one example when, like, the media, it goes one way and some people get attacked and some don't. Uh, but overall, I think it's good to lift the problems in our sport um, so that we can correct them and be better. I got a rebuttal here, Hunter. I got a rebuttal here. Okay, I, Brody wants a rebuttal. It, it, okay, Jake and Dustin, are you guys are you guys going to be the pater- participation trophy parents? Is that is that no. that's that's the vibe I'm getting? Please explain. Please compound on this toxic stuff because Jake says like I don't think these toxic things that are happening in disc golf is like that's pushing people away. Please Hold on. Expl- please explain to me how the yes, NFL me... how the NFL is the most popular sport in. The United States, and please just go to any any like a fan. Go to any fan thread. Like, don't even go to the haters. Go to a fan thread of a team that's not playing good, and look at what they're talking about. The players there, and tell me, in what world is that? In any compare, first off, I think that's fine. If a fan wants to get crazy and say stuff about someone, I think that's completely fine. But in what world are we living in that you can compare? what is being said about players and disc golf being like, yeah, they didn't look like they played that bad or that well. They, 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 I think they're actually bad at disc golf. The other sports, they will talk about your personal life. They'll talk about who you're married to. They'll talk about your kids. They'll talk about, hey, go kill yourself. I don't even know if I can say yeah, that's that. that's horrible, podcast. obviously. Yeah, that's not great. Okay. That's not great, but it's also okay. not pushing people away from the sport. Like, I don't know what we're talking about. So Jake, please. I think it does. I don't think. I okay, think, so I, I never it does said push it. People away. Those people are. You don't have attack. to watch that. You can literally just watch the the sport. The, I know. I'm talking about the. I'm talking about, no. the, I'm the, talking about the personal are, attacks. I think Justin's talking more about what happens on the course. Correct me if I'm wrong, Justin. Who's it pushing away? If I like watching disc golf, how is it pushing me away? Are these personal attacks happening on commentary? If I watch live, no, and Joe no I'm not talking. I'm not talking about again. I'm not talking about what's happening. I was talking about social media too. That's why I brought up the point of I think the professional disc golfers that are on social media, keeping track of these events that are happening, these conversations that are happening, this debate, this drama. I think they need to steer it towards, hey, you know, I want to have a constructive conversation about this. Of course, it never goes that way, but I'm exactly. just trying to encourage hey, people we- based on what I've seen on Twitter over the past few weeks really is like people are just taking it in really toxic directions and we are not a big enough community so you, i just feel like those are the people that i know that are now saying so you think there are people that like playing disc golf that are on twitter and they come across a tweet that's to- that's toxic and they look at that tweet and go you know what i'm putting my disc away i'm not playing disc golf anywhere is that what you're saying is happening I'm saying people might not want to go out and participate as much in in local leagues and local tournaments if they're seeing that people in their areas are starting to say pretty messed up stuff about people yeah like what i mean those are people that i wouldn't want to go play with what messed up stuff i believe me on this one brody i don't want to go down that road right now (laughs) i'll send you some examples on twitter i'll find them but i think we we know there's one account i don't want to name the one account who's impersonating a legend in our game in climo sure yeah yeah just block block the account Okay, oh, I have. No, right, don't what, worry. I'm just saying. Okay, so but the what, people that are now supporting him are are kind of spreading that towards other places, and I just I don't want to keep blocking people. I want to just see disc golf content. I want to see things that I like to see. I know, but th- this is that gatekeeper thing. People suck, and people suck. There are people. There are yeah. bad people all over the place. This idea that you want to keep the sport the way that you want to keep it. I hate that. I hate that. If you don't want to play with certain people, don't play with certain people. If you don't want to consume certain content. Don't consume certain content, but this idea of where we're saying like, oh, I don't want that. I don't want this. It has to be like, I hate that. I've always said that is like, if you don't like me, if you don't like my content, that's fine. Don't watch me. Don't follow me on Twitter, whatever. That's fine. But this idea that we have to have a certain type of person play disc golf. And oh, by the way, when you're in disc golf, you have to say this. That's what's holding disc golf back. What are we talking about? Like that, that is what's holding disc golf back. This notion, people like you saying, I don't want that in disc golf. I don't want that in disc golf. Right. But I'm, I'm going back to the root of the question, which was the pros who are getting upset with this drama. Who cares about they, them? That's You're what, making millions well, that's of what dollars. That's what the question was about. You're, millions? 
Oh, some people all. are making millions I mean, of dollars playing disc golf. Yeah, I know some. I and some other people are making hundreds of thousands of dollars playing disc golf. If you so don't the want question. to deal with that stuff, go go flip hamburgers down the road. No one's forcing you to play disc golf. I, I'm I don't, saying you're always going to be in that limelight, but I'm about. saying the pros can help drive conversations too in a more healthy direction. That's what I'm trying to say. How? By being more of a voice of, you know, here's what I'm seeing online. You know, let's talk about this instead. Or like trying to draw people more towards, I mean, do these things work all the time? No, not really. But at least having a voice and saying, hey, these are things that, you know, I'm not going to engage in conversation. I'm not going to entertain these people who are clearly trying to get a reaction out of me. Like, let's have conversations with people who want to have more constructive conversations. Also, like what pros are actually even like engaging in stuff like this? None of them That's what. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, if, if pros are upset with that level of drama, that's what they have to do. If they're upset with drama on the course, I agree with you that that's part of being a pro player. Okay, I'm again, saying we're keeping saying it professional. What, what are we? What are we? What are, what's the? What are we saying? Drama? Like what pros? Because I think we we're just like beating around the bush. I have no idea what we're talking about right now. I thought, <laughs> like, enough. what? Are, you're saying pros are upset with the drama. What are we talking about here? What pros and what drama? Let's let's put a name to it. Honestly, uh, this question was stemmed yeah. from Paige Pierce coming after tour life. That's where this question was rooted from. Okay, now, what so drama she was referring so to is why I put quote unquote, because I don't know. Okay, so let's talk <laughs> about that. Let's let's use that as an example. So what's what's what should have happened in that scenario? No, I, not I push think that's people away from disc golf. No, I, that's not one where I'm saying she handled that pretty professionally, I think. I mean, she, she kind of got caught off guard, it seemed like on the podcast getting asked about it, but Wait, what? Um, she brought it up. We mean she she got caught off. She brought she, up that she didn't want to go on our podcast. She literally the thing, but I think but what, I think what, she, what? she handled it. <laughs> I think she handled it in a way that was literally dropped our name. She the question wasn't, hey, you didn't go on tour life this week. What happened? The question was, hey, you've been pretty busy. What's what's it like? And then she also didn't even know the name of the staggered stance. She didn't even know the podcast name that she went on either. That's a yeah. shot at staggered stance. Right. Like Trey. Wait, so what are we talking right. about here? I don't know. I look, I'm just talking about what I've seen on social media over the past few weeks. It does kind of rub someone like me the wrong way. You're and right. It probably doesn't media. rub everyone. They get off yeah, of social media. Don't don't open Twitter. Oh, believe me, but that's let's see, that's a tough thing to do when you're somebody and who block wants to the people, people that you don't want to see. What you want to log into my account real quick and see the stuff that gets sent my way? <laughs> A little bit, but no, I don't. <laughs> but no, that's <laughs> what I'm saying is like you can either you can either look at stuff because that that's and I, I you know I'll talk to I'll talk about my wife here a little bit too is we've had this conversation before if she gets super riled up when she sees me go tweet and sees people come after me right because she's super defensive and so what does she do she when she sees me tweet now she doesn't open it. She doesn't look at it because she knows it's going to go down the wrong path for her. She's going to get riled up. She knows because the problem is she knows that I don't care. Like when I go on Twitter and someone says, hey, how about you uh, go kill yourself? You suck at disc golf. You're awful. Go back to ultimate. We don't want to see you. Do you think that bothers me? If it did, I would be I would be a really depressed person. But I've been dealing with this stuff from like day one. And you either have to you either say, hey, this doesn't bother me, or if it does bother me, then get off of social media. But this idea of like censoring, and that's another thing, Hunter, that we didn't even talk about. Some of these other podcasts and some of these other YouTube channels are censoring comments now. They're literally deleting comments. That, what are we doing here? Right, but some of them are drawn from like actual just hate and personal attacks, and they're probably would delete ones if they told players to exactly what you just said. If they told someone to go kill themselves, I bet they'd delete that too. They probably aren't deleting the, the thing the things... that says Brody sucks at disc golf and shouldn't play ever. They're not deleting that, but they're saying, but they're deleting other ones. That's all I'm saying is like it's you are picking and choosing what you're deciding to delete and not delete. When you start censoring, when you start censoring, it gets really, really it's 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 not a fun, it's not a it's. I don't know. I, I, yeah. I think I think you either. I, I've never been a fan of censoring. That's all I'll say. I've never been a fan of censoring. Comments. I do have to admit, I I have deleted multiple comments on the podcast channel. They were all from porn bots promoting okay. site, but 
I do have to come clean. How I have dare deleted you. those. That was, that was me, actually. Those, those <laughs> might be those might be I did okay feel, to delete. I feel a little justified for that. They didn't really want our audience seeing that, but hopefully that's hopefully. What's that's the okay. worst is when you think you've dropped a banger tweet and you see a bunch of people are liking it. You're like, yeah. And then you go look and see who's liking your tweets. You're like, all right, well. Shout out to Elon Musk there. <laughs> yeah. yeah We're the control of the bot. bots on your it, platform. Yeah, getting our engagement all up, hyping yeah. up the engagement. Well, Mr. Here, Beast, here's the Twitter deal. video is getting 150 million views somehow on Twitter. Here's the deal. We've got three people at nine. I've got to make a decision here. And I, I do have to lean Brody Smith's way simply because I am a fan of the drama. I think the drama, I understand that there's such a thing as bad press and I understand all of that. But at the end of the day, when people get riled up, they care a lot more about something than if we all sit back and twiddle our thumbs. Not saying Jake and Michelle. Well, Michelle, you didn't really push for much in the debate. Sorry there. I know it was a shouting match. And Jake, I'm not saying you weren't pushing for drama. I understand what you were saying. But Brody got passionate. And when you get Brody riled up, you got to keep him going. So we're going to have not him in the 100? finals. I apologize. Uh -oh. I just Drop wanted to say for the visual. No, not a bomb. But for the visual, like, Hunter, no one can see you. But the entire time you were sitting like this. <laughs> I, was, like I was intrigued. He, he loves it. He loves it. I was intrigued. Popcorn, and no one saw your reaction. That was so fun. <laughs> yeah, I was very intrigued. I was also, dialed in there. That's the thing. Is this like if this was disc golf? I'm all in. I'm all in. I could sit back and watch this all night. Feed me. Saying, feed too, me is, keeping up with the Kardashians or whatever. I'm in. Yes, that's what I was saying. The, there, there's a reason why there's a TV show on my stupid. You know, I leave the I leave the TV on for Schmel back there because he sometimes goes back there and likes to be in his little moan. And it's like on Bravo or one of those shows or whatever. And sometimes I go back there and there's this show where it's a bunch of dudes that showed up to a dating, like a dating show. All these dudes showed up and it turns out that all the dudes moms uh, are the ones that, that you're show. Wow. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say, Jake? Uh, oh, no. I like this, though. Jake, shut the grenade again. Everyone get out the way. <laughs> That's the whole point, brother. Why do you like that show? Because it's entertaining. There's yeah. stuff going on. If they played disc golf, that would be There's the drama. stickiest show I've ever There's seen. Drama. <laughs> yeah. There you have it. There you it's have not it. Everyone, it's not everyone being buddy, buddy, and friends and giving out participation trophies. All right. Oh God. <laughs> well, into the finals. That wow, what a twist. You know, I can't believe Jake end, loves that show. Maybe we all do show. see eye to eye. You know, I'm maybe, mute myself maybe and turn we all that are on the same page. The that's incredible. Okay. Oh, finals topic nice. here. Finals topic. We'll take a pivot here. Things will probably cool off. We've got Discmania is having probably the best season of all manufacturers performance wise in MPO, yet their discs are noticeably absent from all available top selling lists. Why do you think that this is, and how long do you think player performance at this level will take to change that fact? Uh, Dustin, we're going to have you choose if you want to go first or second, as you were the first one to get to 10. I'll go first. All right, Dustin, floor is yours. All right, so first of all, I think there's like a ton of different variables in this. One is the disc that this many players are actually throwing, right? Because some of them are throwing old and other made stuff that you can't buy, and so it doesn't really help sales of Ganon is throwing an Iron Samurai 3 or some older run of PD2 that people can't get their hands on. Like, that's kind of killing your product at that point. Now, I do admit that he is throwing some newer stuff, so it's helping some of those molds, but it is kind of an issue when you're throwing old stuff. Also, I think Dismania now lacks legacy. You know, a lot of these companies that are at the top of the selling list are companies that have been around forever, and they have some type of legacy player as a part of their payroll. You know, whether that's Macbeth and Pierce over at Discraft, whether it's Innova just being a legacy brand in general, you know, whether it's the fact that MVP made this huge surge because they picked up big names like Simon Lazat and Eagle McMahon, who are also big media presences as well as good performers, whereas Dismania is going through this transition phase where they've lost other legacy players, and they're rebuilding off the backs of people like Burr and Klein and Gavin Babcock and Alden Harris, the Vlog Squad, you know, Ella Hansen and FPO. So you're going through the transition process. And so it's going to take time to kind of catch up, I think, to kind of build that new legacy in that regard. I also think media presence wise, like, yeah, you have the vlogs that are coming out of that squad, but they're still not out there consistently putting out like practice round content and, and doing a lot of the things to kind of market the disc outside of playing, which I think is is tough. I also think there's a lot of confusion within Dismania. Like you have you know, them making the new originals to get away from Innova, but then you still have the evolution line, which is clearly made by Lad264. But then they have the active line, which is made by another company. But then basically all their new stuff is also 
de facto trilogy because they're all underneath House of Dis. So I think people just kind of now think of this mania as essentially being trilogy. And like they almost lack an identity in that regard now because of how mixed up all their disc lines are and stuff like that. I think it also hurts that their stock stuff is kind of overrun by like zeta's moon and cosmic fury and like all these crazy special edition discs and stuff like that as opposed to like tour series discs that still have the same mold name but you're just attaching a player's name to it or doing like a special plastic or something like that so i think there's just a lot of different variables in play that hurt disc mania all right so dustin thanks disc mania is kind of all over the place brody what's your take on it well yeah i'm you guys know i'm not like a huge manufacturer guy um so i don't know all the names of discs and all this stuff that dustin just said my first question would be like, are they able to even compete in the demand? Like, are they, are, you know, are their discs just sitting on shelves or are their discs moving and they're not able to make enough as much as Discraft is, MVP is, Innova is? That is a question. Also, you know, Discraft, uh, Innova, the, uh, they're in big stores. They're in retailers as well, not just disc golf shops. So I wonder too, like that might be a factor as well. Uh, the other one that is, I think the biggest factor though, probably is like, if we're looking at the player side and we're, we're saying, you know, players are the ones that are really moving the needle. And we obviously saw that with uh, Simon going to MVP, right? We saw what could happen there. We saw it when Paul went from Innova to uh, Discraft. So we've seen it before. So we do know players do have a big enough reach and a big enough pull to actually impact sales of the disc. Looking at their team, who do they have? Kyle Klein. What what do we, what is he what is he best known for? Being one of the most underrated players. Like when you're making a top 10 list, you always forget like holy oh crap, like yeah, Kyle Klein is like definitely a top 10 player. He's the first one to forget, right? Gannon Burr, probably the number 1 player in the world right now. And has been one of the top guys, but for whatever reason, whether it's a slow play in the past or whatever, he doesn't have nearly as much pull as a Calvin Heinberg does in Innova. Paul McBeth does Simon Eagle. These other people that are in these Ricky, other people that are in these other things, Nicholas and Tilla, he's kind of turning into a Kyle Klein. Michelle basically like discredit his one win when in fact, he's a top 10 player in the world. Like he's turning into the next Kyle Klein. So I think that is maybe the big issue here. Okay, both made fantastic points. Uh, I, shoot, I was hoping it was going to be a clear-cut thing. <laughs> really hoping one of y'all is going to slip up. Because, look, it, the, the fact is, Discmania, it does seem lost to me, to Dustin's point. I think they do have a wandering brand identity because what they once were and what they built, they're no longer. But to Brody's point, the people that are pulling the brand along, it's just really, you know, their one guy, Gannon Burr, has a lot of people that don't like him mainly because of the slow play and stuff. And that does also play into it. So I think I'm going to give the win. I'm going to give the win to Brody simply because he leaned into <laughs> the player side and went with that, which is where the question was coming from. Cause I mean, for instance, disc mania this past weekend at Beaver state fling had five players in the top 10. Yeah, That's I mean, crazy. Yep. And yet for some reason they just, their discs just aren't moving to answer your question, Brody. They are sitting on shelves. Most right. a lot of their discs are available at a lot of retailers. They are just sitting realistically. It's probably both what both people said is true. I think what Dustin brought up is like even the diehard disc mania fans probably were kind of itching to leave with Simon and Eagle because what we know and love what we love to throw just isn't there anymore. It's not the same discs and they're trying to rebuild but the rebuilding process goes to Brody's point where the players are trying to rebuild on a lot of them either get forgotten or just aren't and don't nearly have the fan base that the Calvin Heimberg, the yeah, Sam Lazard, I, I the agree, but I do have. wonder if that can change now that they do have that whole like vlog squad of Alden Gavin Babcock. Could, so that is a pretty popular help. YouTube channel and you are starting to see like Berg get out there more media wise. And he is a goofy guy and kind of a funny yeah. guy, honestly, when you do watch him and some of the content that's out there, but he doesn't like really source it on his own channel and doesn't do it consistently enough yet. I think it's kind of the big problem. It's actually the same well, issue Calvin, that I think. Yeah. Calvin doesn't do anything on it. No, sure. Calvin, Calvin has He's the gift more, of Jomez. 
Yeah, he does have that gift as well. And, and I think it's the I think the other example, by the way, is Matty O. Like, imagine if Matty O got marketed more, how much more plastic West Side would sell if they just put a camera on that guy as goofy and as funny as he is. So I think it's just like a a lack of like taking opportunity, you know. And and hopefully this man can figure that out. It is a weird one though, too, because you say that like, oh, this this guy would be so much more popular if we saw him so much more. But then you do wonder, like, is that part of the allure? Is a part of the allure we don't see a lot of them. Like we, if we were seeing Matty O come out with a podcast every single day, would that would we? You see, what I'm saying like there is a part two of where there is a mysterious side to some people. Um, I think I think what you're saying is true if the person doesn't have a personality. Correct. So I don't think that applies to Matty O, but I think it would apply to a lot of people. Of like, well, but what if, kind of what like, if every it might time... even apply to Calvin to a certain extent of like the mysterious of Calvin Lee is but, part of the draw. But real quick, what if every single time we hear Matty O talk, it's just Alabama football? And I'm not saying that is the case, yeah. but I'm saying like, what if that was it? And you're like, oh, he that's just his shtick. He just talks about football. You see what I'm saying? Like there is a lore to it, not knowing and being mysterious. I agree with you. I think Matty O on a podcast or Matty O, he was doing those practice rounds too he was. with Westside. Um, but I think that's because it was partnered with like a media company who's no longer really out there doing stuff. Sure. Sure. So I, I think kinda, West was paying that. for him, but, um, but it is one yeah. of those things too, that is going to be very interesting for a lot of disc golfers because in golf, you can get away in other sports too. You can really get away. Like you could be the most boring quarterback and have no one outside of your fan base. Like you, like no one outside of your team, like you and make millions of dollars. You could do that in golf too. You could literally do a meet and greet in golf and have five people show up because no one cares and be super wealthy and not care at all. I don't know if that's the case in disc golf. It's not. It's not. Not at yeah, all. Because like the prize money's not there and the guaranteed salaries aren't there. That's, yeah. that's the only thing is like that isn't the case. And so that's why it's like, I know it's scary for a lot of people, but I'm trying to tell you right now, you are better off like going out and like saying what you feel and saying, don't go and do this stupid stuff that you see after March madness, where the college kids sit down and they've got a script and they all say the same thing. Like, yeah, we just went out there and we played really hard. Um, you know, it's, a, it was unfortunate, like just say what you feel. And I think, yes, you will turn some people off, but I think you also will get a lot of people to respect you coming out there. And who knows, maybe that is something that will spark disc golf moving forward of where well, players are being more open and like willing to talk about stuff. It's also about players being more willing to do content and do social media. And you are starting to see that happen. Like Ella and Holland just started doing practice rounds together for FPO, which has been kind of cool. Um, so, so you are seeing people, but it's just, it's, it's taken a while for people to, to take that next step. And honestly, I think it was honestly, Brody, people like you doing it, that kind of kickstarted other people deciding, Hey, actually, this is a big deal. I should start doing this too. The other thing too, at the end of the day is there are some boring people. Yeah, sure. Like I, I can't sing. So me, like all of a sudden making TikTok videos and me singing, that's not going to do anything. Yeah, sure. There are people that play disc golf that are, that, that, what's that? I would, I would watch no, it. Don't, don't, don't take me. You can, don't you me can find it on his own YouTube channel. Watch. If, you, if you know the right place to look, you can find Brody yeah. singing. I definitely Ooh. have some singing stuff. But, um, or AI can make it happen. We'll but, figure it but out. But at the end of the day, you know, there, you know, out of the top 50 players in disc golf, there might be five interesting people. Majority of people in the world are boring. That's fair. That, Brody, I mean, we're going to give you the floor is. if you have something for your victory lap or if you just want the majority of people are uh, boring to be your victory lap. That can work too. Which is fine. I mean, it's completely fine. Um, I, I find myself to be very boring 99% of the time in my life. But uh, I'll say this. I think the only time I've ever won is when Hunter has hosted. Because I think one people. thing, Hunter's very, st I'll say this. I don't want to take a shot at Trevor. Right. He's, he's going to get his PS five and all that. But I will say this, like Hunter doesn't give points. He's very stingy with the points. I mean, look at this 11 points here is the winner. A lot of these episodes, we hear a lot of people be like, I agree with Brody. I, what Brody has said, I agree. I, you know what? Brody makes a great point there. And then they seem how they somehow get more points than me. That's all I'll say. I'll leave it at that. It's a great show. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, Jake, we bring the drama next time because that's what the people want to see. They want to see the moms and the young boys link up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to leave it with that. Uh, <laughs> all right. We'll talk to you next week.